Hello. <laughs> Um, so I am calling this, I know it had a much fancier title. I'm, I've been asked, I'm really loud, but I've been asked to use the microphone for the video, so I got you. Um, I, this had a much fancier title in your brochure, but I've been calling this, with the help of Megan, uh, the real world of ed tech when grad students stop being polite and start getting real, if anyone needs <laughs> to watch MTV. Um, and this is, you know, an affectionately the spring fling for 2013. So, uh, who am I? And why am I here talking to you? This, I'm Katya. You can tweet at me if you tweet. I, don't, I won't be offended. Uh, this is my email. I'll give it to you again at the end. Um, and here I am dressed as Ibuki from Street Fighter at Comic-Con. It's like one of, the, one of the reasons I came to this program initially um, was because I do things like this and I was into games. And I was also a teacher at the time teaching uh, English as a second language to immigrants. And I thought, how can I put that into my classroom. Um, so I came to this program. Uh, so Francine mentioned that I work at Elon Media, which is a game design company um, here in New York. We also have a studio in Seattle and one in Arizona now. Um, and I've been there for three years next month. And I started there when I was an intern as a DMDL student. Um, <coughs> and I interned for a couple months uh, to fill my requirement for the class. And then they kept me on continuing an internship and I became their education intern specialist and then from there a freelancer and then from there a contractor and then after a whole year and a half of basically a year and a half application process I became a real person um, and was a full-time employee and now my title is learning content producer which is a little confusing because that's barely half of what I do is produce learning content. I do a lot of working in the field with teachers and students um, and just, not just in schools, but also in camps, after school programs, museums, libraries, and, and homeschool environments, community centers, any place where there's kids who want to make games and grown-ups who want to help those kids make games. Um, so I do a lot of figuring out how to help them in their fields, whether that means teaching classes or teaching professional development workshops. I do a lot of working with designers and programmers and artists on the games that we make and telling them what actually works in the real world. And then I do a lot of this. Uh, going around to places and speaking about my work and speaking about game design specifically, not just games in education, but kids making games as a learning tool. Um, I work on this game, GameStar Mechanic. It's a game and a game making tool. Has anyone heard of it? A couple people, awesome. Um, and it's for middle schoolers, so I'm kind of in this very specific track of middle schoolers making games. Uh, and I'm happy to tell you more about GameStar later if you wanna know. So Francine asked me, when she asked me to do this talk, she asked me to talk a little bit about the trends that I've observed in the real world um, with all of us living in one big house. Uh, so the trends that I've observed in the real world, really I've been, I've been in the world of ed tech for three years now as a professional and the buzzwords change super fast. Um, when I started, everything was, it was mostly about distance learning and that became online learning and now it's blended learning. And um, this, this is the one that's kind of sticking around right now in the, in the world of kids in education. So I don't know what you guys are necessarily into, but if you are thinking about classroom work with ed tech tools, blended learning is like you're going to be sick of this word um, if you're not already. So I do a lot of work with thinking about how we can create interesting and innovative blended environments in classrooms, having a physical brick and mortar setting and then having a virtual setting and seeing the different cross sections of those two. Um, another thing that's a trend right now, which I think is even more exciting, is the educators and technologists coming together to make stuff trend. Um, so there's a lot of these initiatives and collaboratives. One of them that Francine mentioned that I worked with was the eDesign Labs Imagination Camp. They are a group that takes, uh, that goes around and seeks out teachers who are teaching in public and charter and private schools here in the city um, and asks them if they want to collaborate with people like you guys and me to actually make tools and put together proposals and grants and get money to make uh, educational technology that will one day go into the classrooms. And this is just one of many, many initiatives like that that are popping up all over the place. I don't know if you guys followed what was going on this year at South by Southwest EDU, but there was a huge buzz about how can we make these relationships between technologists and educators more fruitful. So that's another, I mean, this is, it's super hot right now. These, one day we're gonna have like a celebrity couple name for educators and technologists, but we don't yet. Um, 
Grown-ups learn forever. <laughs> so MOOC's massive online open courses is bigger now than it was when I started just three years ago. This field is so rapidly changing that uh, I, I feel like every day I'm, I'm behind on what I'm supposed to you know, be talking about and knowledgeable about. But MOOCs is something that's super popular and is kind of staying around. And so again, it's not, it's not really my forte, but even someone who works with middle schoolers and with kids is constantly hearing from teachers about these open courses that are coming out of all kinds of places from MIT to Stanford to wherever to hopefully here, um, taught by you guys. So, uh, and, then and then more importantly to me and my work is grown-ups caring about kids creating and apprenticing. And I wrote here that we're moving forward to the 1800s. A lot of what, I've, I went to the WebWise conference, which is uh, the IMLS Museum and Libraries uh, group conference last month in Baltimore and I went to a makerspace panel before I did my panel on game design and it was a lot about how we want to take theories like apprenticeship and really strongly implement them back into traditional education settings like schools and we were all sitting there being like wow the kind of things you're talking about is what we study when we study you know colonial Boston so um, this kind of movement back into apprenticeship using technology having mentors and students forming these really small group relationships and kind of doing away with traditional classroom settings is something I hear about a lot at work and something that um, I'm trying to implement game design structures into. So those are the trends that I've been observing. Uh, okay, so we mentioned Chile and what I've done there. So I was a consultant on game design and intellectual property rights for the U.S. Embassy in Santiago in Chile and working with the Department of Education there. And I'm actually, I'm still in touch with them and hopefully I'm going back in August to do a similar program. So what I did, here's a goofy picture with me with some Chileans um, at the, a place called the American Corners, which are these pockets all over Chile that tries to take education and put it into Chilean learning environments, whether they're community centers or schools in um, take technology and put it into their learning environments in a meaningful way. So I worked with kids like these kids over here on making game design tools and talking to them about some, so kids love games and we know that. Um, and Chilean kids also love games. And uh, they were excited to make games, but we wanted to use this tool to encourage them to think about what goes into the process of making something technological and the differences between making something technological and making something that is a material, so Chile produces a lot of copper. So we had them, we brought in copper earrings and copper spoons, and if you walk down the street, you can buy like anything copper. It's kind of these tourist attractions, but tur Chile produces the most copper of anyone in South America, I believe. So they all know this, and they're very proud of it, um, all the kids. And then we talked about video games, and Chile actually has a pretty, it's a really rapidly growing indie game scene, but kids don't know that yet. They don't know that there's any games out there that are made by Chileans. So they all think, oh, games come from far away, and then we take them, and then people sell them on the street in discs, and for like $2. And that's how they get their video games. So we talked about, now you're making your own, and we did a whole sim of, of kids pretending to be buyers and sellers and pirates. Um, and pirating each other's software. And this was a four hour workshop which I did in six different locations all up and down Chile. Like I had to fly from site to site because um, it's a super long country. And uh, we reached about 300 kids in, in the couple weeks that I was there um, doing these kind of workshops where you're designing on computers and then you're simulating an economy where you're selling. And we talked a lot about intellectual property rights. Uh, and it was, it was an amazing experience and I think that it was something that obviously I didn't have to do as an American going there, but it helped from a country like America where we do think, oh, video games, they're made here. There's probably some studios near my house to a country where video games just come out of nowhere and then they don't feel like they have some intellectual property worth. Um, so that was the reason I went to Chile was to do that program and I'm hopefully going back in August to do the same thing, but this time with groups of teachers. So instead of reaching 300 kids, we'll reach 300 teachers and then thousands and thousands of kids to get them thinking about how media is also property and how they make it. So that's, that's kind of my side project from, aside from Game Star Mechanic, but it's something I'm very passionate about. So Francine also talked uh, to me initially about talking about international opportunities that I'm seeing because I've, I've done this opportunity in South America. So consulting is what I did. 
I wrote international opportunities, even for Americans, because it's true. Like we don't, you know, we have this gigantic country, and we don't often get to travel overseas um, because, you know, going to New Jersey kind of feels like traveling overseas. So, uh, <laughs> but it's it's in this field, in the field of edtech, there are all the, there's all of these opportunities to connect globally and internationally. So consulting in recently developed nations like Chile is a really interesting opportunity. These are nations that use technology in a first world or a developed country way, but they don't necessarily produce it themselves. So getting their youth especially to have this kind of shift um, in thinking about the technology that comes from somewhere else to be technology that they could learn how to create right there in their home, not that they have the resources to do it. Um, I also do a little bit of work in publishing. Eline Media has a publishing and services side that's not my direct job, but I work with people who have made, uh, spent the last year making games for Nokia cell phones um, that have been released very recently last month in India, Tanzania, and Kenya as part of the Half the Sky movement. And there's two games that we released that, uh, basically what I did was test them, but, but we published them, the company. Um, one is called Worm Attack. It's about, it's a little cell phone game where you are attacking worms that are in your stomach and learning how to be a kid who doesn't get worms. And if you do get worms, that you take a pill and you get rid of them. Uh, it's actually quite fun, and I learned a lot about worms. Um, <laughs> the other one is called Nine Months, Nine Minutes, and it's a nine-minute game where each minute represents a month of a pregnancy and the things that you should do during that month to have a healthy pregnancy. Uh, so these were, I mean, they're super short, really fun games that were made and they were produced here or published here in New York with Eline but developed in the countries in which they came from. So we actually found Kenyan developers and Indian developers to partner with. Um, we also made a Facebook game that is called Our, Our, oh man, Our City, I believe. It's called Our City and it is, uh, it's made for Jordanian <laughs> youth to learn about city building and managing a city. So Jordan is a country where the, there's more youth, like kids who are teenagers and young adults than there are babies or older people because the country has been wracked with war. Um, and these youth are not necessarily educated, but they have to take care of their country. So what did they, you know, how do they have clean water in their town and how do they have a local government? So there's a Facebook, and they're all on Facebook, whether they have a local government or not. So there's a Facebook game out there because they, it's a, that's a, um, a platform that they connect with. And we worked on that with USAID. Um, and then finally, teaching. I actually learned about flat classroom only yesterday from Shad, who's my intern at UN Media. Uh, and I thought this was an awesome little tidbit to add to the slide, that you, you don't have to go traveling to Chile or you don't have to connect with Jordanian publishers to kind of reach this global ed tech movement. The flat classroom movement is connecting kids in your classroom using Web 2.0 to other classrooms and not just saying, hey, you're a pen pal, but saying, hey, you guys are gonna do an assignment together that actually has a due date and actually is part of what you're learning and maybe you're graded on. And so <coughs> embracing a global classroom and there's, if you just Google flat classroom, there's tons and tons of teacher blogs saying, this is how I made my classroom flat, which is kind of funny, but it's, um, it's, it's a new global movement and it's awesome. So that's what I'm seeing in ways of international opportunities. So while I've been doing this for the last three years, I, I've been confronted with this word expert a lot. Um, and I would say like, oh, Francine's an expert, Jan's an expert, but I, I graduated in 2010. I don't really feel like I'm an expert yet, but I keep getting these little publicity things popping up with my name and the word expert next to it. And uh, for a while it felt like I was a fraud and like I, I didn't really know what I was doing. But only recently I've come to realize that this, this field of educational technology is shifting so rapidly that any of us who are actually keeping up with it are experts. So right now, whether you're in the program or whether you're starting the program, you can, you can kind of assume this title and say, I'm gonna pick one thing that I'm really passionate about and know that not very many people in the world are doing this. Like this is, this is exciting and it's new, but there's a lot of disparate populations involved. There's teachers and then there's developers and then there's researchers and then there's academics and we are kind of the glue who's connecting this in a lot of these <coughs> fields. So my niche, niche, I don't know how you pronounce it, um, that word is started in video game design. So that's very different from games not playing games, but designing them, learning about how people design games. And then slowly I layered on middle school to that. I used to, I used to teach high school and, and young adults, 
uh, but I found that I like middle schoolers a lot better, um, and I wanted to focus on them. And then finally, to classroom education. Education happens in all kinds, learning environments that are everywhere, as you know, but I really wanted to focus on schools, especially public schools. And so in the intersection of those three things is me, um, and then I became an expert in that. So really, I, I would encourage you to, to right away start thinking of yourself as someone who really knows a lot more about this stuff than many and many other people. And if you apply yourself and you feel like you find where your niche, niche, whatever is in that world, you can kind of own that expertise. And once you say, yeah, I'm an expert in this, or yeah, I'm working towards being an expert in this, you start getting more opportunities, which is what I found, which is why I'm here right now. Um, okay, so. I asked Shad, who's my, my intern at Eline, what could I tell you guys that could be useful during this talk? And she said, tell us about uh, what you learned in ZMDL that you apply in your work, which was a great answer. So I made a list of the things that I've learned. One thing that I learned when I was in grad school was how to do real research. And more importantly, I don't know if you can read this, but I wrote especially how to skim large amounts of text in like one minute. So really a lot, a lot of what I'm doing to keep up with the, the ever-changing world of ed tech is reading all the time and everything I can. Um, and I wouldn't have known how to do that research and kind of look at these mass amounts of information and pick out stuff that's really important without having learned it going through DMDL. That's honestly one of the most important things that I, skills that I cultivated through the program. Presentation is another one. Backing up my ideas with the, the research that I just talked about, um, you'll see a lot of people in the ed tech world present an idea and say, oh, this is something that's really gonna change education and then they don't have anything to back it up with. So I think by going through a, a graduate school program, you can, you can properly explain how people's research and theories and foundation affect the idea that you're proposing, which is something that's gotten me a long way in my position. Um, Addy, uh, you guys know what this is, yes? <laughs> no. no? Who says no? Jeez, take Leonard's class. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's analysis, design, development, implementation, uh, evaluation, all day, every day. Uh, this, is, this is my life, it's one of these steps, and if I follow them in order, I know that I'm doing a good job. Um, and I've, I've gotten in trouble when I try to go out of order uh, and whether or not I'm actually thinking about this um, method or, or if, I'm, if I'm just like, oh, this is a great idea, I'm gonna start implementing and testing it without doing the proper design and development, um, then you know, I'm in trouble. So using, using this very basic uh, structure that I've learned in Leonard's class <laughs> was uh, been incredibly helpful. Cogsci one, I said just knowing a little bit of UI design helps. It really does. Um, the the ideas of, of knowing how your brain works and how you focus on information, even when it's just, oh, I need to design a really quick blog for my trip to, trip to Chile or whatever. Knowing how to make something on a web page so you're not overloaded cognitively has helped me tremendously um, in just working with designers and also being able to quickly and effectively present information that I've done. Not saying I'm an expert in that at all, but knowing a bit helps. Interaction design, I'm telling you, UI design helps. It's, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's the same principles of how people like to interact with stuff, even if you don't become an interaction designer like I didn't still being in this field, you are going to be working with presenting your information all the time because it's always new information. So knowing how to present it properly, these things I use every day. Cogside too, um, sounds smart while saying constructivist. Uh, it's true, it's like what I was saying with presentation, being able to back up my ideas with, with real theory and pedagogy has gotten me a lot more credibility than, than um, <laughs> if I hadn't done so. Code, I took a couple ITP classes while I was at DMDL and uh, I learned, ba I learned I've, I'm like horrible in Java, but I can make a simple program if you need me to. And I've done programs like, um, you know, if I, if I have a proposal for a designer or for a uh, someone on our dev team, I can spend, you know, a weekend and make a mock-up of something that's functional and say, here, try this, this'll work and you'll get a good feeling for how it is. That's not my job to make mock-ups or to program, but because I can do it, I can save a lot of time. So just learning a little bit of, of these different things like UI design and coding, which I learned through my graduate program here, has been tremendously helpful. Finally, Jan Plas uh, was very helpful. 
<laughs> in general, every class I took of his that dealt with games, um, I use all the time, especially games and research, learning how to ask good questions that are not leading questions, learning how to write a survey, learning how to do a proper interview, learning pre and post test methods. Um, these are things that I don't necessarily use every day, but they come in handy for everything, whether it's me working internally with a team, saying, okay, we're gonna try out this new office layout or whatever, to me working actually in the field with teachers and, and doing research with them. So um, if you weren't already convinced that you're in a good program, you should be now. <laughs> uh, so qualifications. That was another question that Shah had asked me was, what are we qualified to do when we're out of this program? Could you say your take on that? So uh, you, you have all of the qualifications. Um, <laughs> one thing, so what I was my first two years at Eli and I was part of a design team. And you'll, you'll be surprised how many designers, whether they're programmers or artists or game designers, who, whoever, really want to work in education and don't know anything about education or pedagogy or theory. So you being a member of that team, sitting around the team and contributing whatever you can in UI design or code or whatever, you come from a background where you know foundation that they don't. And you will be integral on a design team in the ed tech space, even though you're not an artist or a developer. Um, now I'm part of the business team and it's the same thing. Someone who knows a lot about marketing, someone who knows a lot about social media, who knows about doing research for business, doesn't necessarily know what it means to be in a classroom and stand in front of a group of, I don't know, 30, 12 year olds. So having this kind of on the ground educational experience or being able to explain pedagogy is also integral in a business team. Um, working directly with educators, if you work in a school, you're qualified to do that as well, being a curriculum director or um, designer. Managing programs is another thing. If you, be, if you manage a camp or manage an after school program, it feels like a lot of uh, work that wouldn't necessarily have much to do with us, but just coming from a managerial standpoint and having your experience in pedagogy and design is also super important. But I mean, mostly a lot of companies don't know what to call you, but they want you. That's what I found, that they're like, we need someone with all of these skills in these disparate areas who knows a little bit about each of them, especially about how people learn. We don't know what that position's called, and you'll see all kinds of like learning guru, or like <laughs> education research master, or whatever, but those, those are our positions. It's hard, I wrote a list of titles, but that, that's not even, you can Google those and you won't even come up with all of the opportunities. So keeping an eye out on places that you think are interesting, and then seeing what kind of what kind of holes you could fill, like looking at an ed tech company and saying, oh, you guys don't know enough about middle school, public middle schools in New York and saying, I'm the person to do that. Um, that might not, your role might not have a title, but that you are definitely qualified. <laughs> um, and finally, so this is stuff I wish I knew about when I was you. Uh, these, I can have Sava or whoever send links to these things, um, websites, newsletters, whatever, if you're interested in them. But these are newsletters that I receive and teachers that I follow. This is just a handful. And I wish that I had been doing this the whole time. Um, if you're interested in classroom education especially, these are, these are the, super, the super links. They kind of tell you everything that's going on so I can keep up to speed and still feel like I'm the expert. Um, the three teachers at the bottom, Mr. Walters, uh, Kevin Hodgson, and Jenny Doherty are, um, are teachers who are full-time classroom teachers and spend all of their free time blogging about their classroom teacher experience using ed tech tools and reporting on how they really work. So if you don't have time to go into the classroom to test one of the tools that you're researching, these people do. And they are happy to tell you about it. And those are just three of my favorites of many, many, many. So I thought I'd put this up here, um, but I can give whoever the contact later. So hit me up. Um, this is my email. Again, I would love to connect with any of you. And that's it from me. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. I'm also an ESL teacher. I've been in public schools for a long time, and I teach here at NYU. And I'm just I'm, um, thinking about applying to the program, and I don't have a lot of um, background in technology. I wondered if you did, and even if you did, um, what you would suggest, what kind of skill you would suggest developing before entering the program, or mm -hmm. how important that is in considering whether or not to go into this program? Yeah. Do you want me to repeat that for the thing? OK. I'll try. Um, the question was, considering entering this program as an ESL teacher, 
without a lot of technology skills, what, um, what skills did I have before I entered and what skills would I suggest developing before or while entering the program? So uh, I had the skills of being a, a gamer. <laughs> um, I really didn't know much more than that. I didn't know how to program. I could build a rudimentary web website. Um, but really, the most technology I did was like playing RPGs in my friend's basement. I, I, but I knew I was into it. Um, I used a lot of technology in my classroom, which I think helped me more than actually learning to code or uh, learning UI design or UX or whatever. Um, I, I ended up saying, OK, if I'm going to apply to this program, I want to test some things out. So I started doing things in my classroom, which I hadn't been heavily relying on before. Like I had students when we were uh, learning listening skills start using Skype with each other even though we were in the same building. Just little things like that. To c and that gave me more ideas of how technology would be used in a classroom because I knew I wanted to work in a classroom setting. And anything from using uh, video editing tools like or video collaboration tools like VoiceThread in my classroom before I came to the program. So using as much as I could, even stuff that I wasn't sure was appropriate in my classroom or wasn't sure how it was going to work was really important for me. Um, skills that I wish I had, I mean, I wish I was a real programmer. <laughs> uh, but if I don't think you need to be at all. You don't need to know how to write code and make programs work to be proficient and excel in our field. But you do need to know a little bit of computational thinking. And that could even be something like using tools that are made for 12-year-olds like Scratch or Kodu or whatever, which give you this kind of idea of how to think in loops and if-then statements and whatever. It'll just be really helpful when you do, especially now that you've been moving <coughs> to Brooklyn and you're going to be surrounded by people who live and breathe this stuff, to be able to communicate with them even a little bit will be invaluable. And web development skills? Um, it depends on what you want to do with web development. If you want to you know, post your research in a really flashy way, then <laughs> sure, learn some JavaScript. but. Um, I, I've found that that unless you want to be a web developer, you don't need to know more than the basic HTML, CSS. Uh, it, it's been more valuable for me to know about computational thinking and writing code so I can communicate with the development team. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay, so you mentioned that you're a specialist in your particular field. Right. So was that after you got into the program and went through it, or was this something you thought of before you entered, and how important is it to have that, to know what you want that to be before you go in? I definitely didn't know I wanted to work in uh, video game creation with middle schoolers when I came into the program. I did not know that. Um, I figured it out pretty quickly, and I figured it out through my internship at Elon Media, but when I applied for internships, I went to everywhere, even places that I knew I would never work. Um, just to see what the inside of the offices looked like and to hang out with the people who work at these places. So I think I went to like six, seven, I don't know. I went to a lot of, of studios <coughs> in New York. Um, coming from the classroom, I'd never had an office job before. I didn't know what to expect. So I kind of, I walked into Eline and I was like, oh, these people are people who are saying things that I'm interested in. Why are they talking about middle schoolers? Why are they talking about video game design? And I, I kind of followed them onto that pathway. So I didn't. I didn't know I was passionate about it before that, but I do highly suggest like running around um, and looking at different places to figure that out. Yeah. You talked about coming from education and going into technology. I'm actually the opposite. I'm a user experience designer um, that's looking to do specific research in schools so that, for example, when I'm designing um, education software, that I don't, you know, have to deal with like a programmatic person that doesn't understand technology. Right. So you could have somebody developing curriculum that really understands curriculum, but they don't understand user interface design. And so um, would this program give me both so that mm -hmm. I in turn am designing as the curriculum designer? You know what I mean? Yeah, um, what, what you will get from going to DMDL that you wouldn't get um, from just walking around in classrooms and talking to teachers is a strong foundation in pedagogy and theory, which, I mean, I, I was a teacher for many years before I came here and I, I wasn't versed in that. And it's been, it's just, like I keep saying, it's been invaluable as someone who 
needs to pitch ideas, whether they're design-based or curriculum-based. Um, alongside that and simultaneously, I would suggest going into schools like you mentioned. And one thing that I found really effective here in New York is going into charter schools as opposed to independent or public schools because charter schools are a little more flexible, but they still draw from a public school population. So you get this varied and diverse population, but you also are able to walk into a classroom and just kind of visit with the teacher without having to go through a bunch of red tape. Um, right. So coupling, coupling that experience, and if you do that simultaneously with picking up theory and foundation and pedagogy. So there, I mean, I'm really talking about three pools, right? You have the design and the UX <laughs> and UI pool, and then you have the education in the classroom and actually looking at what people are doing and how kids are reacting pool, cool. and then you have the right. learn it from the books and learn it from your experts um, pool, and I think where those intersect, that's that's like the golden ticket. Right. So I guess what I'm saying is like I'm hoping that this program will replace me having to go back and get a bachelor's in education. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get a bachelor's in education. In terms yeah. of in terms of like information design of edu ed tech, you know what I'm saying? Yep. And I think it would. I okay. definitely think it would. Um, but you have to be proactive about being out in the field as well. OK, well, we, we'll have a Q&A after um, this next little piece of the program. And Katya will be here later. So uh, we can continue.